it's so great to be joining you here on the uh, the ninth day of Elul, our season of preparation, our season of renewal, this month in which we prepare ourselves to face the new year renewed and reflective and in a place where we can truly enter the new year ready to begin again. We're so glad to be together this evening for the first of three sessions with our incredible guest scholars. I'm Rabbi Sarah Berman. I'm the Director of Jewish Culture and Programming at Central Synagogue, and I am really delighted to be here with you. We, this evening, will be hearing from two dear friends of our Central Synagogue community. Abby Pogrebin, the former president of our congregation, a journalist, a moderator extraordinaire, becomes our scholar this evening in conversation with Rabbi Dove Linzer, Rabbi Linzer is the president and Rosh Yeshiva at Yeshivat Hovavei Torah, the uh, uh, rabbinical school in here in New York. He is a halachic scholar. He is a rabbi. And between our journalist and our rabbi, we will join them for their conversations around it taking two to Torah. Their conversations will lead us through the parshiot, the themes and the portions of the High Holy Days starting tonight and lasting for the next couple of weeks. Um, these are based on their new book, It Takes Two to Torah, um, which itself is based in uh, their, their um, long running podcast, uh, A Parsha in Progress, um, in which every week for a year, these two encountered and wrestled with Torah from each of their unique perspectives. And so tonight, I hand things over to our reform journalist, our Orthodox rabbi, Abby Pogrebin, and Rabbi Dove Linzer. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much, Rabbi Berman. It's great to be here. And I'm just kicking off because this is my home turf, Dove, Rabbi Linzer. Mm, absolutely. Welcome to the central community. We're so glad to have you. <laughs> you can speak. Oh. <laughs> It's really great to be here, and uh, I love becoming a, an extended part of this community through Abby. And I will just say uh, that Rabbi Linzer and I are actually coming to you from Atlanta because we're actually doing a book event uh, right after we get off of this podcast, but we are wholly focused on, on Alul right now. And I think that what's really interesting about uh, what Rabbi Berman put in front of us as, as a, a mission for these three sessions we're going to do is something I've just never done before, which is really focused on the Torah of the High Holidays, that we often are very focused on the liturgy, and obviously liturgy pulls in Torah, but to be able to sit with, uh, as Sarah introduced him, I mean, Dove is truly one of the giants of Torah scholarship and uh, learning and authority, um, and he is actually someone who is ruling every day on problems that uh, his community brings to him, the modern Orthodox community uh, brings to him. So his his uh, mastery of this territory is encyclopedic and I am the kind of ever learner who he never makes feel like I'm behind <laughs> behind the eight ball, even though uh, even though I inevitably am playing catch up. Um, and one of the joys of our Hevruta over these years has been that we're not just teacher and student, but that we're constantly kind of pushing each other. So that's how we're going to start today. We're going to talk about these three tent poles, basically, of Rosh Hashanah. And uh, why don't you at first just lay out what those three are? Sure. Um, the first day we read the Torah, it's the story of the birth of Isaac. And it's because Rosh Hashanah is so much about God remembering us. It's a day of memory. And it opens with God remembered Sarah as he promised, and God brought Sarah, the son of, in her old age. Um, and then it continues to tell the story okay, of- Let me pause there. When you say remembered Sarah, like remembered the fact that she was infertile and sad about it, and essentially like, I'm going to not forget that you need to have a kid. Yes. But also in the Torah, often um, these verbs like to remember, to love. They're not just feelings or things that happen in our mind, they're through action. So if God remembered Sarah, it means he acted on 
the promise that he made to her and brought her a child. Um, and then the story continues about the uh, the driving out of Yishmael, of Avraham's other son, through the maidservant who was seen as a competitor for Isaac for, you know, who was going to be the true heir. So that's the Let's reading. Pause there. I know we're going to parse it, but I just want people to remember the, the kind of the storyline is that when Sarah, and she's Sarai at this point, but let's call her Sarah for shorthand. When she's infertile, um, she basically says to her husband, I'm not going to be able to give you this heir so you can take my maidservant and have a kid with her. That's Hagar. And Hagar does get pregnant and does give birth to Ishmael. So that is Abraham's child as well. Yes. Correct? And that was 13 years before the birth of Isaac. Exactly. 13 exactly. years before the birth of Isaac. And then Sarah gets kind of annoyed with Hagar and threatened, correct? Right, yes. And tells Abraham to expel her and yes. the child. Yes, exactly. Which is awful, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Can't give it all away right at the beginning, but yeah, no. that's the story. But presumably, the, the general understanding is the hook for that for Rosh Hashanah is that it starts with, and God remembered. Um, and it's a day we want God to remember us and remember us through doing good to us and through, you know, fulfilling the promises. Um, but then the rest of the story also is very pertinent as we'll discuss to write the themes of Rosh Hashanah. Um, on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, we actually read the next chapter in Genesis. The, the verse was Genesis 21. The next chapter- It's even harder, which is even harder. I just want to oh, say- Oh my God. Right. The second, the, the, the second, that reading of the second day is probably the one, the story that people most struggle with in all of the stories of the five books of Moses. And that's the binding of Isaac, Akedat Yitzchak. Um, and uh, the reason also presumably the tie-in to uh, Rosh Hashanah is that the story ends with Abraham about to slaughter Isaac, but then the angel intervening. So um, Abraham lifts up his eyes and says, don't do it, stays Abraham's hand. He lifts up his eyes. He sees a ram caught in the thicket and he brings the ram instead of Isaac. And, um, you know, of course, the shofar that we blow on Rosh Hashanah is a ram's horn. And again, I just want to some... point out as someone who has, when I was doing my Jewish year, I practiced the shofar, which is one of the hardest things in the world. And the real one is very melodorous. Is that <laughs> melodorous? Yeah, like it smells really bad. And I'm just wondering, is that always the case with the ram's horn? <laughs> they clean but, it out a lot before they want to try it this year. Sorry. Before they get it ready. But in, in the ancient world, that was the classic horn. You know, you could have one mechanical made by like metal, but this was the natural horn that was used. Um, and, you know, the tie in is the shofar, the ram's horn, but also a sense of at least traditionally of memory, that there's a sense that Abraham achieved uh, something quite great in his willingness to follow God through this test, and that we want God to remember, you know, Abraham, what Abraham was willing to do, that if Isaac was knowing that his willingness to give himself to God. So that th that's usually the traditional way it's understood in the Rosh Hashanah context. And when you say there's the connection, the tie, I really never thought, we didn't even preparing for today, it does sometimes feel like it's like, what is the connection? Why these Why these partiot for this holiday? The the people who made the connection are the rabbis, they, with capital R, correct? It's yes, not correct. That there, there's no instruction in Torah or Talmud that these are the things, and this is why these are the passages. Am I right? Absolutely correct. Yeah, in the Torah, there's no idea of a public reading of the Torah appears in the Torah once every seven years. You gather all the people together, you do a public reading of the Torah. But the rabbis then established it as a weekly thing. And actually, some even even during the normal week weekday, there would be twice during like on Mondays and Thursdays, a reading of the Torah. And then on the holidays, also readings that were specifically selected to have a tie into the holidays. That's all from the Talmudic rabbis. Okay, and so then we're going to go to our final parsha that we're going to talk about, which is actually um, not is is a, a haftar, correct? Correct. Yes, it's a passage from the prophets. Um, so there's one really on each day, but the one on the second day is more obscure. So we're going to focus on the one on the first day, and the one on the first day really ties into the also similar theme of the reading of the reading from the Torah on the first day, and it's from the first book of Samuel, Samuel one one. And it is about the story about the birth of Samuel, the prophet, who was the prophet the, that sort of led the Israelites, the Jewish people, until their first king, Saul. Um, and it's about a similar story like Sarah, Sarah, that the mother, her mother, 
his mother Hannah was pre was infertile, and uh, the most that she wanted out of life was to be able to have a child. And she prayed to God, and eventually God answered her prayer. And then the child was given over to God. She had promised, "I will give the child over to God." And then when the child was born, he his life was dedicated to God in the temple, and he became a prophet. Great, and I really want to encourage everyone to put start putting their questions. Um, in because uh, Rabbi Sarah is sending them to me, you know, through the ether from New York to Atlanta. I am getting them. Um, so let's just start. I, I just want to start talking about infertility. I know that it was crucial to have heirs. I understand that that was God's directive to be fruitful and multiply, that it's essentially a commandment. It's core. But it's interesting that the that we're talking about these three segments and that infertility is such a theme um, so why don't you kick us off with your response to why? Oh, wow. Um, so many layers to that. Um, I think one thing to really note is how, you know, the sense of struggle and difficulty in the birth of the Jewish nation, right? God promises Abraham and says, you know, go to the land, I'll show you, I'll make you a great nation. And it's everything is hard. Like just having a kid is hard, right? And um, and that took so long for that promise to be realized. And then finally, in, when he was 87, he had it through even not his wife. And then another 13 years till he would have it through Isaac. And then after he had that son, he was asked to offer Isaac up. And then, you know, Isaac also, Isaac and, and Rebecca can't have a child. She's infertile. She has to pray to God. Um, so it's all, it's this, this sense of, you know, being the chosenness and the blessing, but that blessing comes through so much struggle, I would say, and challenge. I think it's something we can really relate to now. Um, and I, I guess one thing I'll also add is that there's a beautiful passage in the rabbis that says, God, like, desires, longs for the prayer of the righteous, specifically righteous women, and that the, our foremothers were infertile so that they would pray to God and, th and then, you know, and then they would have a child. So there is, I think there's something powerful about the, the profound realization about God's role in our lives and our need to sort of be bringing God in um, is part of that as well. And, and then the fact that there is this other I mean, the first family is Ishmael. Like that's the first, that's the first son. And we don't talk enough about it, I think. And the fact that Abraham said yes, when basically Sarah's like, you know what, this is, I don't like this. I don't like that she's kind of honing in, even though it was her idea that he should conceive a child with her maidservant. And then Hagar is kind of like kicked to the curb in this way. And she doesn't know if they're going to survive. And Abraham doesn't know if they're going to survive. I right. mean, it's it, she she ultimately is kind of cast out. And it's only because God hears her that he shelters and, and gives them water. Am I right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, there's a lot of places in this story that we can question whether our, you know, Abraham and Sarah acted properly. Um, you, uh I mean, when Abraham, when Sarah, when the, the maidservant mocks uh, Sarah, which is actually not, it's the forerunner to the story that we read on Rosh Hashanah. And it says that, you know, Sarah afflicted her and drove her out and she ran away. And um, and Abraham, and, and she told Abraham, like, drive out my maidservant. And Abraham listened to her. Uh, so but Abraham doesn't, he's not happy about it, though. I, where is the verse? I don't know. What is the language around his discomfort with it? Right. So when he he drives out Hagar in the story that precedes ours when she's pregnant, it just says that he like silently listened. It says, and Abraham listened to Sarah's voice. In the section that we do read, when when Ishmael is already 13 years old and he is in one translation mocking Isaac and Sarah sees him as a threat to the heir and to her son and you know, and who's the true family. So then, you know, Sarah basically wants to drive him out. And the verse says it was bad in Abraham's eyes for the sake of his child. His see, son. Let me just read the language. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his mm. son, because of his son, because it's his son. Exactly. And God exactly. said, unto, and then God reassures him essentially like, don't worry, he'll be fine. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman, that's Hagar, in all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, 
for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. So he's basically saying, I'm going to make a nation of Yitzhak, Isaac. I'm going to make a nation of Ishmael. Don't worry. They're both going to be taken care of. And there'll be a future because of because of each. Right. And, you know, I think that it's it, when we read this, it does really trouble us, the harshness of Sarah's actions. But then we have to be bothered by the fact that God backs her up. And it, it, it's hard to read these verses nowadays, a year from October 7th, you know, and not sort of think about some of the echoes here. I mean, Ishmael is the for you know, the understanding is from Ishmael comes the Arab nations. And um, Sarah might be harsh, but she's trying to protect the family. And she sees, you know, Ishmael as a threat to the family. Um, so what do you do when, you know, your primary, she's like the mother bear, right? She's the mother cub <laughs> acting to protect her own. And that's her first responsibility. And when God says the verse you just read, let it not be grievous because your seed will be called in Isaac. She's What she is demanding is something harsh, but ultimately she... I, I got him telling you, your true family and the heir to the divine promise is Isaac and Isaac's descendants, and he's acting to protect that. So the question we're left with is, were the trade-offs necessary? Was there a way to do it not so harshly? She could have sent them away with food and water. In the end, they get sent away and she went, you know, and Hagar is sort of like dying of thirst. But I, I think- I, And I we think never hear about, we never hear about Hagar again. We never hear about Ishmael again. In the Torah. Correct. Well, Ishmael, interestingly, when Abraham dies, it says Ishmael and Isaac buried Abraham. So he comes back, you know, and there's still that recognition. And the rabbis actually make a point. This is interesting because the verse says Isaac and Ishmael buried Abraham. So the rabbis say, you see that Ishmael was righteous because he recognized, you know, that Isaac was the true heir. So he let Isaac take the lead role in burying Abraham. Uh, so it's... um. But what do the I, rabbis I, I, make make of the fact that this is God's people too, and we just stop hearing about them? I mean, it's just interesting that this is such an important line that God put into motion and or blesses in a sense, blesses in a sense. Like I'm going to take care, Abraham, of this other line of yours, but then that's not that's not the the storyline that gets picked up anywhere other than them coming back at his graveside. Right, because God is is still not saying they, you know, they are my the, the descendants of Ishmael are my people. God is saying is you and I. Yes, Ishmael is your descendant, but not all of your descendants are going to be my people. It's going to be only Isaac, and not all of Isaac's descendants. It's only going to be Jacob and not Esau, you know. And I will cause them to prosper, and I care about them, but there is still that sense that uh, you know they are they not favored. Are my, yeah, they are not the chosen people. So, okay, so we have we have Abraham's passivity in this chapter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're going to go to the next one, which I think is more egregious, which is God saying, "Take your son." Um, and and as we get into that, the idea that take your son, your only, right? I mean, the language right. around that is controversial because it wasn't the only son, right? So, so tell so us a little bit about that. There is such a great rabbinic read of that verse, uh, because the verse opens, take your son, your only son, the son that you love, Isaac. And, um, you know, and the simple reading would be that God is trying to, like, really up the stakes. I am going to ask from you this hugely impossible, you know, impossible thing. It's your son. It's the one you love. It's your only son, Isaac. But the rabbis have a little dialogue going on. They say, God says to Abraham, take your son. And Abraham says back, Son, I have two sons. So God says, your only son. So God, so Abraham says back, only son, you know, one is the only son of his mother, Sarah, and the other is the only son of his mother, Hagar. So then God says, the one you love. So Abraham says, I love them both. So then God said, okay, Isaac, you know, take Isaac. But this is another is example of the, of the contortion <laughs> of, so, of some of the kind of the after, the after justification of the thing that we find anathema to us. Hey, what do you mean by that? You have to understand. I mean, this, this, this feels like you're saying something was created to justify, basically, he says, take this son, and Abraham said yes. And you're saying there's this concocted 
hypothetical dialogue that happened. Yes. Do you right, want to put back on that? I mean, is that, are you believing that? No, 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 I don't know. I don't think it's the simple meaning of the verse, but what I think the beauty of that is, is it's exactly the point that you were making before about how difficult it was for Abraham to write off Ishmael. Ishmael, it goes back to when, you know, it says, and the matter was bad in Abraham's eyes for the sake of his son, for the sake of Ishmael. Um, and, um, you know, look, when God says to Abraham, after Ishmael is born, I will give you a child by, by Sarah, Abraham responds, and this is in the biblical verse, it says, like, let Ishmael be, you know, be the one. Ishmael, let Ishmael live in front of you. And God says, yes, I know there's Ishmael, but I am telling you, your chosen child is going to come from Sarah. So really, it's interesting. We normally, you know, you know, tend to, I think, associate often the parental emotion more with the mother. But here, Abraham is the father to these two sons, and he is the one that is holding on and not ready to give up Ishmael. And Sarah, Sarah is the, like I said, the mother cub. It's not only because Isaac is her child, but also protecting, you know, what she believes is the future of the Jewish people. But we don't hear from her for this during the story. She's a silent actor in this story. About the Akeda. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, that's what the, the, the contemporary commentary is, is that if God had asked Sarah, she would have said no, you know, <laughs> there was a reason God asked Abraham, <laughs> um, you know, and that gets back to that mother love. But also, you know, one thing I will also say is I think that what a theme going on here is like blind faith in the divine promise and acting to make it happen. And I think one of the things we see in the story with the biblical mothers, the foremothers, is that they act in a way that the, the, you know, the fathers, the forefathers are more passive. So, you know, God promises Abraham that you will have a child when he says, go to the land, I promise you. And then he's there many years and he doesn't have a child. And originally it's Sarah who says, take my maidservant Hagar. We're going to have a child and we're not just going to wait around for it, you know, have a child with Hagar. In the end, she didn't like the results, but she She's was just saying, one. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure exactly. it out. I'm going to make the to-do list. Right. We're going exactly. to, we're going to do and, you know, and God says, you you know, Isaac will be the chosen one, but Sarah sees there's a threat to that. We have to act. Right. So it's, you know, and like similarly, Rebecca is the one who acts to ensure that the best thing gets passed down to, um, to to Jacob and not to Esau. So there is something about the our foremothers who are the ones that are, you know, acting to make sure God's promise. When God says, take your only son and offer him up as an offering. Right. It's like what besides that, what that's asking, you know, giving up giving up my the child that I've waited for for all this time, an act of murder. You know, it's also, what about the divine promise that you, God, said that Isaac will be the future of the Jewish people? And uh, so I think that, you know, the commentary, again, it's not an official commentary, but the comment that so many people make nowadays, which is if God, God had asked Sarah, she would have said no, you know, <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I want to read the this verse where we're kind of getting to the moment, um, which, you know, is so cinematic and so heartbreaking. Um, it, we're in Genesis 22, 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went, both of them, together. So he goes. Isaac doesn't say, I mean, he does question where is the lamb for the burnt offering, dad? Like, I thought we're sacrificing something. I don't see the animal. But he goes along and Abraham goes along. Do they both, are they both signed on for God's test here? Do they, do you think that they both know this is where God's testing us and we're just, we're going to show up for it without objection? You know, it's not clear in the verse what Isaac knows or not, but um, the traditional rabbinic interpretation, and I really do believe it is it is what the verse is getting at, is that Isaac, when he asked that question, what about the lamb? Where's the lamb? And Abraham gives this very indirect answer. God will show for God's self where the lamb. And then he says, he doesn't just say God will show the land. He ends it with the words, my son. God will find for himself the lamb, my son. Right. So if you just think about that juxtaposition, it's almost like the lamb is my son. You could be the mm -hmm. lamb. And then it says, you know, and then it says afterwards, and they both went together. The same words it said before, somehow a sense that something is bothering him. He's realizing something is up. 
Abraham is not giving him a direct answer and he's still continuing all along together and in agreement. That's the way the rabbis read it. And I think it's really suggested by the verse. I, I want to say, if you allow me just one profound insight I've heard from this many decades ago by the biblical scholar Uriel Simon. And he said, when it says what Abraham took with him up the mountain, it says he took the wood and the fire and the knife. And the actual word for the knife in Hebrew, ma'achelet, means sort of like, it's it's the only time that word is used for knife, and it almost means something like flesh eater. It is a very visceral type of word to describe the knife. And like, and and when, when Isaac speaks to Abraham, he says, behold, here is the fire and here is the wood, but where is the lamb? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't mention the knife. And what, what Professor Simone said is like, he was terrified of that knife. He saw that knife and he couldn't even mention it because of what it was, you know, making him afraid of. So anyway, that really, oh. I think, you know, makes us feel that Isaac might have been aware. And then it says, and they went along together. They it's powerful to me that he trusts his father. It's not just, he's not necessarily trusting God at this moment. He's trusting his dad and his dad is trusting God. I, I want to just talk about, about what we, you and I, a little bit argued about when in the book when we got to this portion because you actually kind of pulled me up short with an idea that I hadn't thought about because this is just so unimaginable to any parent, particularly any helicopter parent, <laughs> that um, I would ever do something like this were it asked of me. And obviously it's just an unimaginable um, sacrifice. But you said something to the extent of, is there anything that you would die for? You know, what, what, what would you live for and what would you die for? And particularly after October 7th, this Parsha has been changed for me. I have thought about the parents that either send their kids or bless their kids as they go off to fight this war, very young, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, and a sense, frankly, of this idea of whether it is faith or faith in the country or faith in the joint project, that they are willing that they are willing yeah. to sacrifice a child who very likely may not come home. Um, I know I'm mentioning this because you were generous enough to allow me that you personally lost your nephew, um, I think seven months ago um, in just this way. And it just, it makes me see this verse of these verses differently. And I would love you to react to whether I'm I'm over contemporizing it. No, not at all. I will tell you in, in Israel, the Akeda like theology is very dominant. It is often brought up in the context of we are sending our children to war. We are off, you know, they they are also risking their lives, but we as parents feel that we are sending them off to risk their lives, possibly give up their lives because of a belief in something that is even more important and because it is worth it. Um, and, you know, in a way, what makes it more um, palatable in the contemporary Israeli context is that they're very young, but at least they're older than we imagine Isaac to be. I mean, the rabbis say that Isaac was like in his 30s at the Akedah, but that, that that's not of, how we imagine it at all. It kind of right? kills the drama. <laughs> right, we imagine that he's six, seven, ten. I don't know. Okay, you know, but I would still say, you know, you said that Isaac believes in his father, like has faith in his father. We raise our kids with an ideology and a belief system. You know, we send them to schools and there's an ethos and a credo and they're in a country, you know, with parents who choose to make Aliyah and move to Israel. They bring this Zionism and this belief. So there is a lot of a way in which that has, was, is part and parcel of the child's readiness to give up their lives or to risk their lives to serve their people. Um, so I think it is highly, highly relevant in terms of how we're thinking about this. Um, and it also is more palpable, palatable, excuse me, because again, part of the problem is that it was Isaac that was taking, you know, excuse me, Abraham that was prepared to take Isaac's life. It wasn't Isaac that was prepared to sacrifice his own life. Um, so the, you but know, I would say that, I mean, I've heard many parents who chose to make Ali up, you know, particularly from America where they knew their child would not face this, yeah. um, who are now saying, with kids who might be conscripted, should I come home? I mean, should I go back to America? Like that's part of, I think this, where you're weighing sacrifice, even if it's not ultimately your agency as a parent, it is a decision as to kind of where to be. Um, exactly. To be in yeah. Israel is, is to know you're, you may sacrifice. 
Absolutely. You know, my you mentioned the, the, that my nephew was killed seven months ago, and my brother and my sister and brother-in-law were doing a whole you know speaking engagements around the states talking about it. And even during the shiva, you know, people had he, he, my brother-in-law said people had asked him like, you know, if we hadn't made aliyah, our son would not have given up his life. And do we have any regrets? And you know, and he said, look, he said. If I had to do it all over again, I would do the same thing. It's obviously the most horrific thing ever that our son lost his life, but it's also, you know, like it's it's. I am so proud as a father that 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 he, you know, for what he did in sacrificing his life for the country, and you know, it, it, it's a tremendous sacrifice. But I would not have made a different choice. Wow. But you have to respect people that aren't prepared for that, or yeah. you know, because. It's a, it's it's unimaginable what it can potentially be asking of us. So I want to get to questions soon. So let's do the the third, which is Hannah. Um, and I'll just say Central did uh, an incredibly powerful. Uh, it was it was a Rosh Hashanah decision for the Hannah story to have women who have faced infertility um, in our community to speak from the bima because, as you know, there's such a expectation in the Jewish community. Uh, that one would be able to have children. And often there's a lot of language around uh, children as if it's a given that everyone has them, that no one has lost them, that no one has been unable to have them. There's so much that's geared towards uh, generations and the meaning of passing on. So that was very powerful. I'll just mention that that was done a few years ago around Hannah. But so we know that she's praying so hard that she looks like she's drunk. And I just want to talk about that moment because that fervency Someone could, it's, it, it can be that she sounds like she's Meshuggah, or it can be that she's praying as hard as anyone's ever prayed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the, the really shocking thing is, is that, you know, is that the rabbis learn the model of prayer of our classic Amidah and silent prayer from how Hannah prayed. And it says, you know, that she spoke Wait, from, from her how heart. Hannah prays. You, you broke up. Yes, how Hannah prays, and that she speaks silently so it can't be heard, but her lips are moving because when we actually, you know, move our lips, it makes it more real. But then if we, but by being silent, we're also in intimate conversation with God. So that's a really interesting balance right there. But really the pouring out of the heart, um, so much of the, our, our concept, our model of what prayer is, is learned from Hannah. And the idea that Ailey, who's the name of the Kohen, thinks that she's drunk, I think that that's so interesting in terms of, you know, men sort of superimposing their, you know, their understanding on the women around them. And you had that earlier in the story because uh, her husband, Elkanah, um, sees how distraught she is that she doesn't have a child. And Elkanah says to her, but he says, I, you know, there was, again, it was another one of those stories about competing wives, you know, two wives. And he said, you are my beloved wife. Isn't my love of you greater than that of seven children? And she's like, uh, no, I need it. I want it. <laughs> Don't you, the man, tell me I should be happy enough with your love. So I, I really think that that's a, a real lesson there about not superimposing our understanding until we understand where somebody is really- And it's significant that she, win, not wins, but delivers. Like it, her prayer is answered. I mean, I just think that that's also just a very powerful story. Maybe creates salt, false hope for, for those who, you know, are feeling like this, this still might never happen. But to me, there's something, it, it, the lesson that's coming through in a sense in that Torah, proverbial Torah is telling us something that like, if you pray hard enough, it can actually- change your fate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I so appreciate that. And it echoes back the story of, you know, the, the Torah reading part, which is Sarah, which opened with God remembered things that seem like they are never going to happen, that there's some promise or some hope. And, you know, sometimes, and you're right, sometimes sadly people, those dreams never materialize, but some to, to hold on to the hope that eventually they will, they might be realized and they will be realized. And we have to hold on to that is I think a powerful parallel there between the Sarah's being answered and Hannah being answered. I, I really do Can appreciate you, that. Uh, Joel, just before we go to questions, just give us a sense of who her kid is, because the fact that Samuel, it's not just that she has a child, she has one of the most important prophets in our yeah. story. And, and that feels whoever, I was going to say whoever wrote this narrative. I know you, that you believe. No, no, actually, Abby, it's better because 
<laughs> you don't believe we're not in the right five now. books of Moses, so it's all right. <laughs> okay. Um, that it's just like it's if you were going to write it as like a film or or a novel, right. there is like it's not just that she prayed hard. It's not just that her prayers were answered. But look who she delivered, Samuel. Right. Right, because Samuel is this prophet political leader that um, lives for many years, um, and he's the bridge between this period when they have all these judges, it comes after the book of Judges, and when they have their first king, which is King Saul. And the whole story of the book of Judges is that a lot of these judges were maybe strong political leaders, but they were not particularly religious. They were not particularly good at keeping the people aligned with God's will. Um, and you know, the, the, there were a lot of vicissitudes about the fortunes of the nation. And Samuel is both a leader and somebody that is a prophet and dedicated to God. And there's this, you know, and, and under his ruling, rulership, leadership, uh, the people really live a type of a life in the land that God had wanted them to. So it's extremely powerful. It doesn't, it's not, you know, and then it transitions ultimately to the kingship. Um, if I could say one thing before before we transition also about the parallel between these stories, yeah. um, the Akeda story, and this came up in our learning ahead of time, which I had never really thought about or realized. Um, a, you know, Abraham is asked to give up your son and give it up as a sacrifice, slaughter your son on the altar. And at least we can understand the end of that story is God is saying, I don't really, I don't want that. I don't want human sacrifice. But when Hannah promises, if you give me a son, I will give my son over to God. Mm. And the giving over of God that she does is by devoting his life to God, that he becomes a prophet, he stays in the temple. And, you know, particularly nowadays when we're thinking about all of the ways in which we're being anti-Semitism and in Israel, and we mentioned, you know, sacrificing lives. The concept, there's a concept called Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of God's name, which is often associated with how does one sanctify God's name? Martyrdom, when you give up your life to serve God, you know, people, when they wouldn't convert and they would martyr their lives. But the other, the better way of doing Kiddush Hashem is not through dying, but through living. And how do we live our lives so that it's a sanctification of God's name? And that's, I think, what, you know, Hannah does when she, her giving over of her son is to devote his life, you know, the way he lives his life and his leadership that really is a sanctification. I love that. And I feel like all three of these also make me think about this moment in terms of what is asked of each of us to do that might stretch us. I mean, I'm not going to go to child sacrifice. But if we put the sort of the symbolic sacrifice of just what would discomfort us in this moment, because we have the faith that we do and the sense that we're part of a people that needs us all right now, it just mm -hmm. feels like the stakes are higher and we all have to show up. And I read these differently now in terms of fervency of prayer, in terms of what we maybe should be giving up, in terms of kind of what is God asking us to do? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's right on. All right. So here are some of these questions. And uh, let's just start with, um, is it possible that Abraham himself truly believed that God would provide the ram? That essentially he would never actually have to go through with it. It's a great question, whoever asked. Oh, that, that is such a great question. You know, that's how I would like to read the story. Um, uh, and I don't know if people are familiar, there was a... Um, philosopher, Sean Kierkegaard, who wrote a book called Fear and Trembling, which was all about grappling with the idea that how could God command Abraham to do something which it would be murder, and how could Abraham be prepared to actually do it? And it's a whole series of, you know, grappling with different ways of trying to get a hold of the story. And he actually says something like this. He says, Abraham's faith was one that he sort of said, I will do what God asks, and I'm prepared to do even this horrific thing. And at the same level, I believe that in the end, God won't want it from me. In the end, I believe that it will not come to pass, you know, and holding both of those together, I think, I, I would like to believe that as well, that when Abraham says God will show the lamb, like Abraham was, he, he believed in God's promise that Isaac will be the descendant and the people and was a like belief in the absurd, you know, at the same time. Was, well, which, is, which in a way gets was, echoed later when the Israelites are being, you know, taken out of Egypt by Moses and they are the opposite, just so doubting and so resistant mm. and so disbelieving of the, of this impossible thing. Like, are you kidding me that there's a promised land and should we really leave Egypt? 
where at least we have food, like this idea of just not believing that God's going to be there in the end. Um, that oh, that is such a good point because, and it's the opposite also because they were shown all those miracles, right? After, miracle after miracle after miracle, like, okay, how can you kill still not believe? And, you know, and they weren't able, and here Abraham is not being seen anything and being shown the opposite. And is he able to still hold on that somehow in the end, I still do believe that it will, won't come to pass, you know, that the promise will come through. Okay, someone wants me to ask you, Doe, for your take on the alternate view that the Akeda was not as much a test of Abraham, but a test of God. Oh. Another good question. Oh, a test of God. Could I, 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 well, I think this is what you and I were talking about. Meat? Well, this yeah. is what you and I were talking about was, is God willing like, to do this? Like, in a sense, you know, how are we supposed to view a God that would ask this of someone? And the fact that God doesn't, I mean, I don't know this, I, maybe I'm reading into the, to the questioner's question, but right. we're watching but, but, God here as much as we're watching Abraham. Yeah. I mean, like, did God fail by not having enough faith in Abraham or by asking something so harsh of God? Um, you know, that's, I, 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 I'd like to pass it off to you because it's hard for me. <laughs> I'll, I'll reframe that. I, I under, let me say it this way. I, uh, I, 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 you know, I don't like sort of uh, sort of the thinking about a fallible God in that way, you know, and, and thinking about that. But what I, I will say hard for you, I just want to tell yes. people, whoever might be uh, so nice to pick up our book, that it's a theme of our impasse or our healthy dialogue, which is that right. Rabbi Linzer has to always justify what God did. And I don't. <laughs> right. No, I, I like I, I appreciate that a read of like, look. God made a mistake here and God was, you know, and God sort of realized, oh my God, I shouldn't be asking that of people or that's not the right thing. But that's not my theology, just to be very clear about that. But what I will say is I, I would like to read the story that, you know, do we emphasize the beginning? This we talked about also in our book. Do we emphasize the beginning of the story or the end? Do we emphasize, this is horrific. God is saying that God, that we should be sacrificing our, 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 our children for God. Or do we say the point of the story was to the God to teach us a lesson that we that God will never ask us to sacrifice our children? You know that was the the point of the story is the end of it. And you know I, I think I shared this with, with you. I actually you know, grapple with why was it the angel that came and intervened? Why you know if God if God said take your son, then God should be the one to override the command, not some lowly angel. And I actually think that this was where Abraham really passed the test, because Abraham could have said, like, I'm not listening to an angel, I'm listening to God. But he realized that, like, even if that voice is a smaller voice and it could be ignored, you have to listen to the voice that is saying, God is not going to ask this type of unethical, immoral act from you. And that was like a second passing of the test. I really like that. It also makes me think that we should be kind of alert to where our angels are. Mm. like who's telling us something and we're not paying attention because we think they're the smaller voice Excellent. okay we got to keep going uh here we see the image of strong demanding women protecting their families their people is this consistent with how rabbis continue to portray women and likewise that men are more passive and bending to the will of god you know how the rabbis you have to answer this on behalf of all rabbis oh my gosh um yeah exactly <laughs> Look, the whole rabbinic enterprise was ve is very androcentric, which is not to be confused with misogynistic, but it just means it's men talking to men and looking at the world through men's eyes. Although just uh, remember that our rabbi is a woman, so not all rabbis are androcentric. Well, when I say the rabbinic enterprise, I meant, I assumed I was being asked because it was referring to like the Talmudic rabbis. Um, you know, I think that it, I'm, I'm trying to think about, the rabbis definitely speak about you know, like we, women having a particular wisdom and insight that men don't. And we could be actually grateful that there are those positive comments or offended that any type of way of, you know, essentializing could be seen as sexist. And there definitely are negative statements in the Talmud around women. It is such a large question, but I don't specifically around strong women protecting their families. I have to think about that more because it's not, that's not immediately coming up for me as a way in which the rabbis characterize women in general. But I think it is very much here in all these stories that we read. So I agree. Um, okay, another great question. Can you discuss prayer as appreciation 
compared to prayer um, when asking for something, prayer to ask for something. Um, I think of, and this continues, I think of Rachel Goldberg Poland's extraordinary statement at the funeral of her beloved son, Hirsch Goldberg Poland, thanking God for the years she had with him. Oh, it was so heartbreaking. Um, Allowing, albeit that she wanted more. I mean, um, it's just, I was so struck by that, that she didn't lead with anger, that she didn't lead with bitterness, that she didn't even focus on how he died. She started with gratitude. Yeah. You know, that is so much a part of our tradition. Um, the the whole book of Tehillim, of Psalms, are, is, that used to be in the ancient times, that was the prayer book, right? I mean, for some Christians, that's still what they use essentially as a prayer book, you know? And they and those were almost all, sometimes it was calling out to God from, from, from straits, but it was dominantly songs of praise is Tehillim. And even in our statutory prayer, the Amidah, the central part of it is request. It opens with praising God. It ends with giving gratitude. The section of the prayers beforehand, the Sukei de Zimra, literally are verses of song of, and they are about praise. But I, I think it's a real, you know, I, I think somehow the dominant model of the Amidah makes us think very much in terms of, of, of request. But praising is a very central part of our, you know. Uh, and, and just as we're about to approach Rosh Hashanah and Slichot precedes it, and I was just struck at the, at the times that we do entreat, that we do beg. I think that's also powerful. And I'm sure that Rachel Goldberg Pohl, and I know that she begged also, I'm sure, for, for him to return to them. And just the fact that that's in our tradition in such strong ways, both. Is yeah, like, and it, it directly gets back to the you know to the stories of of, Han, of of Hannah praying for the child, and you know, and Abraham praying for the child, and all of the prayers for the things that we long and that we need. In the end, I think you know because we mentioned the statutory prayer Amida. Amida literally just means standing, and I think the idea of that what what however form of prayer it's about standing before God. It's about being in a relationship. And when we're in relationship with somebody, we express our gratitude. You know, we sometimes express our frustration or the things that we need. It's and... also vulnerability. Like I'm just standing mm -hmm. before you. Mm -hmm. I'm just here. My full self, being yeah. honest with who I am and presenting myself to you. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, and we're going to get to some of the, I think we have some wonderful things um, in store for the next two sessions. Um, and as we approach the last 10 minutes, I just want to remind everyone, the third session's in person with really good food. Not that you need good food to come for the learning, but it's Russ and Daughters. So come and meet Dove in person. Um, I want to go to this question because it does begin to tee up what we're going to talk about next week. Um, do you think the test of Abraham might anticipate Yom Kippur in terms of Isaac's life being spared and our hope that we too will continue to live? I think that's 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 resonant for me. Yeah, it's like even that when even when things seem like the, the you know the the, the 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 knife is right at our throat that ultimately there will be some intervention and some salvation and actually you know there's a rabbinic saying like that the rabbinic saying is like is exactly that even when the knife i, I mean i'm literally quoting even when the, the sharp knife is against your throat never give up hope and never give up faith so yeah, where yeah. Is that? where is that uh, it, I, I have to remember the exact Talmud I'm, I'm, I'm stumping you i'm so happy to i know you. well it's somewhere in the talmud but where is it the, where is it i <laughs> Back but I never, I, I never put it together with the image of the Akeda and Isaac, which is exactly what wow. that was, you know. The Amazing. angel never asked that in. question, Yasher Koach. No, yeah. and also, I just, you know, this is not laughter. I know people close to me right now where that knife is very real. And mm -hmm. just this idea of, you know, coming to services this year and saying these prayers at the Unatana Tokef and knowing that book is open and not knowing if they're going to be sitting another year, if any of us are going to be sitting there another year. I just think that the Akeda is also operating yeah. there too, as we've discussed it. Um, here's an interesting question. Was the maidservant Jewish? Is Hagar Jewish? No, I mean, and that's, well, first of all, the whole concept of Jewish, you know, has is a little anachronistic, yet. right? But, uh, but, but still, but that's the whole point. He was not the chosen family. It was Abraham and Sarah and the child, you know, from them. And so these become, it becomes another nation. It becomes, and actually her, her um, ethnic origin, it says that she was a Egyptian maidservant, which is also 
fascinating because it was after he spent time in Egypt and Sarah was taken by, you know, the Pharaoh and then they came, came out with great wealth. So presumably this was one of the servants that they came out with or slaves and probably. Um, but uh, yeah, not Jewish. And and Abraham's not a Jew yet. Right. I mean, <laughs> what, it kind of depends what you mean by that. I know, but, right. I know, but I'm saying he was Abram and now he's Abraham. Right. So he's yeah. already made that crossover. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, was there competition in the household because Hagar felt superior because she conceived when Sarah didn't? Yeah. Even Sarah gave uh -huh. even though Sarah gave permission for Abraham to have a child with Hagar, and wasn't that considered adultery? Good question. Even though the Ten Commandments weren't in the picture yet, <laughs> this person knows the timeline. We are not in the Exodus yet, and was right. not an issue at that time. Wow. Okay, so a couple of questions. So actually, the first part is right there in the verse. It says that Hagar saw that she was pregnant and her and her mistress, you know, her, the Sarah, Sarai, became despised in her eyes. Like, and you just imagine the scene, you know, the scene, oh, look, I'm pregnant. I'm I'm going to bear Abraham, you know, the patriarch, you know, the, the son and, you know, this and, and uh, Sarah, Sarai, she was with him how many years she couldn't have a child. So actually that she was, the sense one gets is that very much so that he was uh, treated Sarah very disrespectfully. Didn't, doesn't justify Sarah's actions, but but he was using it as an opportunity to demean Sarah. Definitely is in the verse. You know, as far as the adultery thing, in okay, I, I'm probably going to shock some people, but as you know me, Abby, I'm always very honest about these things. So in the Bible, <laughs> in the Bible, the Bible actually uh, accepts uh, polygamy which is a man being married to more than one woman. Um, it does, so adultery is defined as not as a married man having sex with another woman, but as a man having sex with a married woman who's not his wife. So for uh, for him to take Hagar would be like taking another wife or, or whatever, it would not actually be adultery. The interesting thing is that Sarai was the one who recommended it, who advised it and asked for it. And I will tell you, that now, you know, we live in an era of, um, you know, we've been discussing infertility. And of course, surrogacy is such an important way in which people are able to have a child. And the model of Hagar as a surrogate, as I cannot be the one to bear the child, let this other woman, you know, be the one to bear my child. And that will, through her, be my child, um, is a very powerful one. What explains the passivity of Abraham, which was also my word, in the context of the Akeda? So whoever wrote this, I agree. And then the fact that Abraham challenged God in the context of the destruction of Sodom, that's Sodom. Is this about learning over time? What is the role of love and justice in these narratives? That's a big oh my question. God. What a great minutes. question. What a great question. Yeah. You know, because you could sort of put the passivity down to, the, well, he just had blind faith, but he's willing to argue with God with the story of Sodom and, uh, Sodom. and that story, actually, we discussed this now because you asked me, you know, we were asking ourselves, this, you know, this question beforehand that actually appears before the story of the Arcadia. So you'd like to think, actually, <laughs> he learned from the Arcadia, but it actually doesn't work that way because that happened before. So he was courageous and then he wasn't. Right, you know, or he was courageous on behalf of his people, but not his own family. Right. So the best I can do here, and I would love to hear your thoughts, Abby, is that it's sometimes a lot easier to argue on behalf of others than on behalf of ourselves. You know, we always feel so to defend the innocence of Sodom and Amora, There's no, there's no question he has no vested interest in that. Nobody is going to think that he has ulterior motives. But if God is asking me to take my son and he's making this demand on me and I'm going to say, God, that's unjust, that's not fair. Well, maybe I'm maybe he will have self-doubt. Is Am I really sincere about that? Or am I just trying to get out of this hard thing that God is asking from me? So I, I also think that the Sodom example is not so much uh, something that Abraham's going to lose in. Like he's he doesn't have it's not going to affect him the same way that sacrificing his son is. So and that's why it's easier to argue with God. Yeah, yeah it's not I mean, in, in some way. It's like as soon as it's me, it's what you were saying. It's hard to advocate for yourself. But it's also that God is actually this is my test. The Akeda right. is my test. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The dome is not not the same in, in a way like I, I can actually take God on um, in this instance. But 
but the, but I'm sort of on the line in terms of my own faith with right. the other. Okay, final, final question. And thank you all for staying because um, these have been so good. Um, da, 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 da. I guess this is, do we both, is the Parsha for reform observance the same as Orthodox? Um, I'm not sure you know that. And uh, yeah, sure. maybe Rabbi Sarah can jump in. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, uh, very quickly, in terms of Torah at Central Synagogue, yes. In terms of Haftarah, we read Hannah, um, and really only Hannah, and only sometimes. Okay. All right. And I will say that there is a different Torah reading for Yom Kippur, quite a different one, and we're going to discuss that in a future. Yes, uh, everyone class. should really be excited about the next episode, because the stakes are a lot higher for atonement. Um, I want to thank Rabbi Sarah Berman and everyone on the adult education team that made this happen and asked us to do this. And all of you who have online and offline been so supportive, first of all, of me, because it's my central family, but also of this crazy enterprise that I did with Rabbi Linzer, uh, especially now when the Jewish people have been buffeted in ways that I think are so ugly and de demeaning and frankly deflating. I think that both Dove and I feel like um, we should buy our, our Stars of David necklaces, but we should also go back to the book that unites us all, that keeps us all talking, that has sustained us. And the fact that you're all showing up for this Torah conversation in advance of your own preparation for the high holidays just means the world to us. So we hope to see you next week. Same channel, um, the 19th and then the 26th in person. Dove, do you want to have any last words? Just, I really, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to keep on learning Torah with you, Abby, just in our preparation. And right now I'm always learning new things and the opportunity to be learning with the entire Central family. So I'm really looking forward to next week. Bye everybody. Bye.